Hi everyone, it's Will here. Can you believe this is session 6 of Mint Pro? Hi, it's Emma. Let's have fun today. Hi everyone. Welcome back to Mint Pro. Today we're going to talk about thinking. Programming? We do that every day. Today we're going to think about programming a game that plays against a computer. Oh, a game again. I dig it. By any chance, does thinking mean programming? Yes. Rather than playing a game, it's a method to create a thinking computer. Can we make a thinking computer with Scratch? Well, what do you think? Let's start with, what does thinking mean? For example, for the robot in session 5, we thought about making the robot travel along the road. When the car deviates from the road, it turns and gets back on the road. That's what we thought of, right? That's right. But doesn't it look like the programmed tracing car is thinking and traveling along the road? We know the program, so we understand it. To someone who doesn't know the program, it might look like the tracing car is thinking. That type of programming is called rule-based. It's a type of creating AI, or artificial intelligence. That means programming the rules, so that when this condition is established, this action is taken. The rules are arranged as many times as necessary. The system checks which conditions are established and then operates. Or the tracing car's conditions like when on the road, when deviated to the right, or when deviated to the left. There was also when it strayed from the road. That's right. These rules were programmed to make the trace in car move. Let's make the computer think with this rule-based programming. Today, we'll program the computer to play tic-tac-toe with a human. Do you mean the game we play with paper and a pencil? Yes. The simple tic-tac-toe game. Players take turns putting an O or an X mark in a 3x3 three three grid. The first player to get three marks in a row is the winner. If all squares are filled with no three marks in a row, the game ends in a tie. In tic-tac-toe, if both players make the correct moves, the game will end in a tie. If the opponent makes a mistake, you will win. Doesn't a computer always have the advantage? That's right. Computers don't make mistakes. Unless you program the computer to play without making a mistake it too can lose the game. Let's think about how to play or the rules. If you are the first player, your first move is a middle square. What if the opponent puts a mark in a corner? Okay, the corner? Then, the next move is the upper left corner. If the opponent plays in the opposite corner, they will have two squares in the same row. That's right. You're on the right track. Well, then you need to put a mark between the two squares to stop them. And, you get two in a row. The opponent will stop you. We can put a mark in the upper row and get two squares in a row. The opponent will stop you again. Only the corner is left open, so we end in a tie. Shucks. So, if we don't make a mistake, the game ends in a tie. Let's organize those rules for playing. If you are the first player, your first move is the middle square. The second move is the opponent's move in the corner. What about the third move? A corner that is not the opposite of the opponent. What if the opponent doesn't play in the corner first? What? Would they do something like that? They would lose. So how can you win in that case? Well, the opponent placed a mark on the edge, so let's see. You put a mark in the corner. That's correct. So the play patterns have been divided into two. Is the second move the corner or the edge? Hmm? We have to make two sets of rules. Shall we start with the rules playing in the corner? If the second move is the opponent in the corner, the third move would be a comer that is not on the other side. The opponent has various options for the fourth move. 
shall we think of all the possibilities? Oh boy, there are so many different moves. That's right. If you consider each move, you need to make rules for up to 850 patterns. Wow. I can't. There's no way I can do that. I knew you would say that. Even with a simple tic-tac-toe game, if you divide all of the moves, there are a whole lot. In this situation, it's important to find the rule of law. Find the rule of law? What do you mean? You have to find the rules for winning. Well, you win if you get three in a row. You need to get two in a row before that. Spot on. You also need a space to make the third move. You need to look at the grid and find that type of square. You say look at the grid, but how do we program that? There's no block to look at the grid. You'll have to calculate the grid. Here we calculate the vertical, horizontal, and diagonal marks, and use the results to determine where is best to move. What do you mean by calculating the marks? I got it. We change the marks to numbers and calculate them. Wonderful. How did you figure that out? How did you figure that out so quickly? So, to make a calculation, we have to have numbers, right? That's right, but... In sports and game competitions, the players often score points against each other and decide the winner by the difference in scores. If your point is positive and your opponent's is negative, you can easily see the difference in score. Consider calculating the marks as a number, for example. Your marks are worth 11 points each. The opponents are minus 10 points each. And a blank square is worth 0 points. Tally the total for the vertical, horizontal, and diagonal directions. If the total is 33 points, you have 3 marks in row, and you win. If the total is minus 30, then you lose. 22 means that you can win if you can place a mark in an open square. Why are the scores for myself and the opponent 11 points and minus 10 points? If you use 10 points and minus 10 points, then when there are no marks, or when there is one O and one X each, the score will be the same 0 points and cannot be distinguished. You can distinguish them if there's a slight difference. I get it. That's neat. Let's see what the totals are, depending on how the marks are lined up. For example, if the total is 11, you only have one mark, and you can still play in an empty square. If the total is 12, there are two O's and one X, and there's no open square. There are 10 variations of lining up the marks. In four of those, all three squares are filled. So that's why we think of the move with the remaining six variations. There are many possibilities. The rules of law really help. Let's get working on the program. Nimpro. To calculate the sequence of marks, we put scores in the squares. In the program, anything with a number in it is a variable. What kind of variable shall we make for the grid? Should we use 9 variables? Like square 1, square 2, square 3, and so forth. In this situation, we use a list. Is a list a variable? It's a list of items, right? Very good. A list variable is a variable that can remember many numbers under one name. First, let's learn about lists, which are necessary for programming. Let's make a list variable. Let's name it square. At first, there are no numbers to remember. How do we put the numbers in? We will use a block, which adds, thing, to square. Let's click on the block to execute it thing has been added to the square when thing is designated as 11 and clicked again 11 is added we use a block to delete all of the squares and return to an empty lock since there are nine squares in a three by three grid first we'll add nine zeros to the squares 
Then, we'll add a block called item number of square to view the number in the square. It's a round shape, just like a variable. So, if we fill in the item number, we can see the corresponding number. That's right. The feature of the list variable is that, you can calculate which number the item is in the list. If you make 9 variables, the name of each will be different, so to look at the variable for a specific square, you will need 9, if, then blocks. I see. Lists seem really handy. A list is a row of variables and is called a one-dimensional array. Let's choose one with the list name, and th square. The tic-tac-toe squares are lined up as 3x3 three three in the vertical and horizontal directions. This is called a two-dimensional array. It is expressed as square, vertical, horizontal. It looks like the Zy coordinates of a polygon. Are there variables like this? In some programming languages, there are. But Scratch only has the one-dimensional array called the list. Then we can't use the list for the tic-tac-toe squares. What should we do? What if you think that you have three squares in one vertical row, and there are three rows? We could rearrange from three rows to one row, just like when we line up to walk. So the 3x3 three three grid would become a list. In what order will you line the numbers up in the list? We could line them up like calculator numbers, 1, 2, 3 from the bottom left to the right, 4, 5, 6 from the left to the right in the next row, and so on. Like this numbering order? Yes. Isn't this how we usually arrange things? What's interesting is that squares for chess are also numbered horizontally and vertically. When they read the plays, they say an alphabet for horizontal and a number for vertical. So bishop to h3. Why do they read it like that? Chess has 64 squares. If they were numbered like a serial number, say 1, 2, from the bottom left, it would be hard to find the number 24 bishop right away. With h3, it's easy to find the piece looking horizontally and then vertically. In chess, vertical columns are called files and horizontal rows are called the ranks. The first is a1. This vertical, horizontal expression makes it easy to find a place, and you can easily calculate serial number, or the number of the one-dimensional list. For example, what is the serial number of BH3? 8 times 3 equals 24? The answer happens to be the same, but the expression is different. So, for example, what is the G3 on the left? 7 times 3 equals 21. That's not right, it should be the 23rd square. The number is calculated as, horizontal minus 1, multiplied by, number of vertical squares, plus vertical. So BH3 is, 3 minus 1, times 8 plus 8 equals 24. BG3 is, 3 minus 1, times 8 plus 7 equals 23. In Japanese shogi, the top right is the first and the vertical is represented by Chinese numerals. The horizontal is represented by Arabic numerals. Now, let's add numbers to the vertical and horizontal sides of the 3x3 three three square. This time, like shogi, the top right is the first. The vertical is represented by Roman numbers and the horizontal is represented by Arabic numerals. Then the 8 is 3 2. It's a strange number. The list number for tic-tac-toe is, horizontal minus 1, times 3 plus vertical. When a human is making a move, they directly choose a square. However, in a program, it is easier to think of the place as the vertical and horizontal, which can be calculated. Let's think about the lineup for vertical row 1. The squares in a row vertically are increased one square at a time, to make the list number. For a horizontal row, you need to increase the horizontal squares. Then what about a diagonal row? Can't we just add one square each in the vertical and horizontal directions? That's from the top right to the bottom left, right? On the other hand, if you go from the top left to the bottom right, the horizontal row would be decreased by one square at a time. The vertical row would be increased by one square at a time. That's correct. Wonderful thinking. 
It's easy if we think of the vertical and horizontal movements while looking at the figure. You're ready to write the tic-tac-toe program now. That's it for this time. But we're still working on it. We're ending with at a good place, just like in a TV drama. This is a long session, so we'll split it into the first and second parts. Next is Thinking Computers Part 2. I hope you'll join us. Bye-bye. See you soon.